Welcome once more. This is Njenje uh, Media TV. Uh, with you this evening is uh, Mazes, okay? We uh, have, uh, in the last couple of days, seen uh, videos, uh, video clips of uh, uh, coming from uh, you know, Olu in Imo State. I have with me here uh, Dr. Sam Amadi to discuss this uh, issue this evening. Uh, Dr. Sam Amadi, you're welcome to Njenje Media TV. Uh, thank you very much, uh, my brother. Was it okay? Okay. Um, let's uh, quickly dive into this, um, uh, Doctor Sam Amadi. In your estimation, what is it? You know, how would you explain what you know the video you have seen, and I believe myself as well. What do you think is happening in Olu? In your own estimation? Well, thank you very much. I think first uh, the video was a, a bit horrifying. Uh, the level of firepower. Uh, oftentimes, you know, you wonder whether it's a scene out of a war zone, basically. But when I saw it, I made calls to some of the uh, activists, human rights lawyers, you know, where, and local activists to find out what's going on. First, the impression I have, uh, well, let's put this way, this is not also unique. We've seen instances of this uh, 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 military attack in uh, other places. Uh, we've seen it in Zakai Ibrahim, we've seen it in MNA, we've seen it in uh, Obi and other places. So uh, basically, raising issue around how the, the the disposition to use military to deal with uh, maybe civil conflict. We are in a state in the country now where there's so much crisis, uh, either uh, relation between different members of the community. We saw what happened in the Southwest, that whether it's uh, headers, flood enhancement, and farmers. So, we are in a situation where there are so many conflicts arising from failure of governance, arising from inability of the political system to uh, distribute resources, access equitably. And of course, to, to be fair to all. So Nigeria is actually in a moment of crisis now relating to sense of citizenship, uh, failure of citizenship, uh, issues around ethnic justice, issues around cohabitation. How do we live together, coexistence? So, but the problem is, each time there's a cop, so what I get from what I got on the ground is that look, there's been some misunderstanding between some traders, Igbo traders, and some Fulani in uh, what they call Amasolo and order. And some of the the, so the militants have waiting wait to stop brutality. The, the report that oftentimes some of those uh, uh, traders are molested by men from the military barrack in Obizu. And so it was one of those. Uh, an attempt to probably um, try to stop such exploitation that uh, crisis developed. And of course, there was uh, attack against uh, persons suspected to be members of the Eastern Nigerian uh, security network and the soldiers. So the details and the actual facts may be disputed, okay? Some people could claim, some report have come out to say uh, it, it, it arose from conflict over attempt to flush out uh, the men of the Eastern uh, Security Network in the forest, trying to protect farmers against attack by killer hessmen. That has been some narrative. But for me, as a, as a legal practitioner, as a, a leader, what matters at this stage is that each of these conflicts should be handled in a civil manner with law enforcement, police enforcement, and the governor should stand up and ensure that there's, that's, that's peace, justice in Imo State. It does not warrant, I'm totally against the resort to bring in military, either to contain restiveness, either to settle conflicts around uh, alleged brutalization. Even when lives are lost, life, loss of life by in any form is something that the police should investigate and the judicial system should prosecute with evidence. It does not warrant uh, use of military in any form. So my view is first is that the call on the military to deal with civic arrest, no matter the proportion, no matter the, the, the degree of that arrest, even if it involves loss of life, is unconstitutional, arguably, in my view. Again, it does not lead to good governance. It shows that the state governors are operating in a sort of emergency. And so if you must have to bring in military, to administer jungle justice because the military's mode of engagement 
is to see the other person as enemy combatant and deal with that. That's not what a democracy requires, dealing with conflict. So, so my view is, is that first, irrespective of the facts of what caused the crisis and irrespective of the commitment of the governors and their responsibility to maintain peace in their domain, the, the invitation to soldiers to, to, to probably maintain peace or attack people, or even the self, you know, the, the military themselves acting on their own in so-called reprisal, in vengeance of revenue form, even if military officers are killed in, uh, in a criminal or constitutional manner, it's not expected of a democracy to allow its military to be, to be, to be, to, to be released against civilians and in most cases, people get killed in this, or who, whose properties are damaged are not persons who may be those who perhaps arguably have attacked the soldiers. So I think it's no no in a democracy. And so I see it as a failure of governance. I see it as a mass violation of human rights if citizens of Olu uh, are now under fear of military attack no matter the circumstances or the issues that are in dispute here. Yeah. Thank you. So we have had reports that, um, uh, you know, women are not able to um, get out to, you know, get what they eat. I don't know how accurate that report is. Uh, that is on one side. But um, you made mention now, while you were speaking at the beginning, you made mention of uh, militancy. So in this case, are you alluding to the fact, uh, you know, that as a result of you know, you, the word, the usage of the word militancy, that's what led to the military incursion of the civilian space, as it were, you know. Have, well, the point is that the, the governor's statement says militancy. By the way, militancy, the way I, I look at militancy is, it's not really illegal behavior or criminal behavior. I look at it from the same way we use radicalism. So, Militant youths, militants in Nigeria context have been those who have made extreme demands or who probably are resorting to violence, quote unquote. That's how we define it. So we started from the, 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 the that war started with the Nigeria uh, struggle. So the militants, the creek. Why are they militants? Because they are uh, resorting to extreme positions, extreme views, radical views, and in some cases, they might be element of violence. So for me, it's not used in a censorious or moral tone. The point is that even if even if they are criminals, let's assume back criminality. The point is that the a, a, a state must have civilized tools to manage conflict. So take for instance the people who were asked, who are said to have invaded the capital, the different political correlations. The Democrats will see them as insurrectionists, see them as uh, maybe coupists, see them as uh, violent persons, see them as even criminals. Other people may see them as basically protesters, but how server, look at the way they were managed. There's no sense in which people are being terrorized on account of those persons who may have committed acts. So my view has always been that whereas state governors may feel compelled to restore peace to their communities, they may feel the long, even if it is an act of criminality. Let's assume some persons came and attacked um, soldiers or attacked um, Fulanese or attacked Igbos in Olo, I still maintain that the government has to painstakingly investigate, fish out, and prosecute through due process of law those persons they think violated the law. The constitution secures the right of every citizen, irrespective of their, their political view. So even if you assume that some persons have committed acts of treason, Arson, killing, murder, you don't have any right to place a siege on a community in a bid to arrest, uh, prosecute this person. Think about what happened in Obibo. The same thing. You can't lay a siege because many people who get arrested, detained, killed in these processes are not persons who may be involved in the dispute. So this might be a real dispute between two contending factions or two contending uh, communities or even. The full uh, traders, as the case might be, and the evil persons, uh, who, or even the traders who themselves are strangers, and the villagers who are farmers. Whatever it is, I am saying that we must have to agree on a minimum that use of military, especially 
not in terms of persecution of a war, like in, in, in the northeast where you see open combatants, people are, are, are killing, shooting at the, at the military as part of warfare. Use of military action in civil arrest or disturbance of quarrel or disagreements, no matter how violent they are, violates the constitutional guarantee of due process. Because the idea is that the police should prosecute, investigate first, find out what happened. And then if there are crimes as a lawyer, then they can prosecute and go to the court. Nobody should be deprived of their life with that due process. So my point is that militants, which the what the governor said, that they are militants, whether they are militants or not militants, there's no reason to deploy soldiers in our law, or there's no reason to use military force against community, because oftentimes, the, the, the first, even if there's a crime, you know, it has to go to due process. Secondly, the persons who get killed or who, who get, you know, become victim of this military violence may not be in any way connected to incidents that the governor is claiming to be trying to contain. So really the word militant or non-militant does not amount to criminality. Even if somebody is a militant, that's not really, um, does not amount to criminality. And even if you're a criminal, there's still a due process guarantee for criminals. That's the point. Okay, thank you. So is there any link? Are you able to draw any parallel between what is happening in Olu or rather uh, what happened in Olu and what is happening within the Southwest, as it were? I mean, you've all seen what has been happening um, mm -hmm. in the Southwest in the last couple of days. I think so. I think from a political analysis, from as a scholar, also as policy analyst, I can argue that that, that's why I started by saying that we are in a time of conflict. There are issues that we've not addressed, issues about, about the Nigerian state, the national question. Right under the military rule, when we are, when Akabashiru was uh, president of NBA, we have thought about national conference. Today, people are talking about national conference. People are talking about referendum. People are talking about even Nigeria, uh, the right to secession. So the country is obviously, in, it tends in a crisis form. That crisis, the crisis of def definition. Who are we? What should we be? Now, from a, a democratic theory point of view, that crisis could be processed whether to a national conference, whether to a referendum, whether to a sovereign conference. Uh, the, the Southwest, Afeni Fere, Arneze, and people are talking in terms of, I've even given a, a deadline for the government to act by abrogating this concern and creating a new framework for uh, that coexistence. So that is the background in which all this happened. But the Southwest crisis has been building up. And what is it? Basically, conflict over livelihood, over ownership, over justice around farmers and headers who have become, in many cases, terrorist headers. Now, three issues. One is that the government has not been very clear and objective in in trying to deal with the matter. So we've seen a, a tendency for the federal government to basically respond more to the need to the, in the defense of the headers and not in defense of farmers. Again, we saw contrast. People argue when the quick notice was issued to uh, Igbos in the north at the, at the, at the, at the uh, at last year, last two years, 2019, the question, the government didn't take any action, there's no special, special statement, no directive to arrest. That was the most unconstitutional and criminal act because somebody, you know, kind of violated the, the citizenship of the Nigerian people, the evil race as a whole. They were put notice to leave. There was no official reprisal. There was no um, attempt to uh, press statement, no prosecution. Again, we saw again, with the Farakuga incident. We've seen also that the president ordered the IG to go to Benue, and IG didn't go to Benue. IG said didn't go, and the nothing has happened. So now the question people ask is that first that the, the government mismanages this process that should have created trust by always acting as if it is a proxy to the uh, full headers community in this trouble. The second point arising from it is that the notion of whether we can exit people from you know, quick notice to persons and the argument around freedom of movement. Now the question has been pursued in a 
in, 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 in an odd manner. Because the questions around, every Nigeria can stay in Nigeria, by the way. But the question is that when people take up of the forest and they pose threat, do state governors have the right to properly uh, kind of control control the threat in that territory? And how, how can they do? Can they ask everybody to, for example, abolish night grazing? For example, ask that to identify all grazers and maintain a certain protocol process so that even if grazing is allowed in the short term because of the, the, the investment in it for ranching, there must be a defined process in which we can detoxify. It's like toxicity. We have to find a way to remove the threats in that grazing in a manner that is compatible with peaceful use of property by the owners of the land. So these are issues that we're not discussing. Now, if you look at the fact that Nigeria is not even one of the leading 10 uh, producers of uh, population of cows, if you look at milk production, look at beef production, cow ownership, we're not anywhere in the first 15 countries in the world. China, India, the US, South Africa, they are far, far ahead of us. Now, the question is, why is it difficult to think strategically around making this, this business compatible with the 21st century? When we have argued around it, some of our fellow friends have talked about um, uh, 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 pastoralism. Now, my point has been that pastoralism is not compatible with the 21st century where land is becoming scarce and where urbanization development has made it difficult that people have free land to roam where without encountering villagers or without uh, competition with other means of livelihood. So why can't we, as someone has argued, that Brunei alone is more than all the states in the south is the land between Brunei is too much. They, they don't have so much. So why don't we make investment to create those ranches around the northern part of Brunei, where they have too much land. With those investments, you create the ranch. Why do we have to create so Ruga? Why do we have to uh, use land that's not available, even the southeast, the, north, the southwest, to create Ruga? If we really want to help the livelihood support system of these headers, then we could have used, created those Ruga in the north, where there's ample land we can invest, create. So why do you create a Ruga that requires expansion into the south? where there's land is not even available. So, so some of these contradictions, therefore, creates the impression that the government probably is not interested in solving the economic challenges of this very antiquated mode of business. Rather, there could be some people have argued that this is maybe a land grab, and the behavior of government does not discredit that, that proposition. Again, finally, on the, uh, on the, on the, on the Southwest issue, is that I think without evidence, but analytically, that that incident may have created, energized several other incidents around the country that will have to deal with more radical means of containing the headers, the full and enhancement threat. We've seen that people in the Middle Belt are fully supportive of, what, uh, of the action by Sunday. We've seen people in the Southeast supportive. So the narrative here that we must take care of on both sides, is that by continuing not to deal with the threat of the full and men, we are endangering ourselves in the manner that there's so much profiling and maybe unnecessary attack against full and as a whole. Because it's, it's pathetic. There are many full and who don't own a cow and who are not pastoralists, who are city full and who, who have no threat factor, so to say, against farmers. But as long as the government continues to appropriate and seem to defend these killer head enhancement, the collateral damage is that we continue to profile, maybe wrongly, and continue to you know, create, they are mainstreaming enormous hatred and dislike and you know, perhaps hate against the planet, which may then convert. So my fear is we are letting the national question fester so dangerously that in addition to our fragile and our failed nature, this might be the time bomb that at the end of the day, it might be a violence that the state cannot control. And maybe those who want Nigeria to break will find it nice. But my problem is that uh, not all 
breaking is nice. That could be yeah. a better way to make a sausage. To make, that yeah. I, 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 I kind of agree with you on that. Now, um, on a final note here, do you, can you draw a parallel between the, the crisis that we see now, especially within the Southeast and the Southwest and the, the new change of command yesterday, as it were, regarding the service chiefs? Well, let me put this way too, from a political reading. You know, oftentimes, um, I am a, I'm a, I'm a student of politics. I want to be led that what's the out of the possible. People have oftentimes think that no regime is so powerful, so insular, and so fortified that it doesn't respond to public policy. But the question is, we don't know how much response, or what actions are true response or gimmickry. Now put it this way, obviously, there have been calls to remove these service chiefs and uh, I would argue that this, the attempt to remove them and the way it's done is more like a palace guard, uh, change of guard, okay? It's, it's a practical response to a crisis, the crisis of loss of confidence in the military leadership, loss of confidence from the population. And so does it herald a significant change? Maybe not, but at least it gives the administration a space to renegotiate confidence with the populace, a space to probably uh, reinvigorate confidence in the military formation itself. The previous, the previous uh, leadership had at least usefulness, they become a drag on even ordinary oppression. So what we are seeing now with the change, it might be a response to the heightening of crisis. And of course, the political managers themselves, they know when to exit, when to create a detour, uh, and when to de-escalate. So these appointments, helps somewhat to de-escalate, but it might not go too far because the everyday experience of the injustice, of the lack of objectivity and neutrality of the Nigerian state is the driver of radicalism. In a nutshell, the Nigerian state's failure to be autonomous, neutral state that, that adjudicates conflicts in a responsible and trustworthy manner is the biggest mobilization of radicalism. So, Will this change de-escalate significantly the tension? Will it reveal uh, trust and confidence in the military formation? I don't think it will be that significant, except the, new, the leaders chart a new direction. For example, finally, if the new chief army staff gets a policy on the way of non deployment of military as, uh, as form of repression, or as form of attack, then it might signal a new beginning and could reverse confidence in the, in the formation. But do you see some, I mean, as you just rightly said now, but do you see something like that happening? I don't think so. I think the pedigree of leadership need to go against that established norm will be too far radical. And I'm not sure that's what they have done. I don't know these guys, but I doubt if their, their pedigree will enable them to uh, take a diametrically opposed or chart a totally new, new path to managing the security, human security concerns in Nigeria. On that note, it will, it will be fair to say that, um, well, uh, the, the change of service chiefs came late and uh, there is nothing new that we are expecting. Yeah, so it, it, they, they have advantage of low expectations. So if the surprise was a big deal for them. But for us, I don't think we have too much expectation. Thank you very much, uh, um, uh, Dr. Samamadi. I don't know if we have uh, uh, questions from the audience and uh, those that have joined us. Um, I can see, uh, um, you know, uh, Chudo Numa there, uh, Marcel Ngobehe, and a couple of others. So if you do have any questions, you can uh, uh, quickly raise up your hand. I can unmute you. And, um, you know, the conversation has, uh, you know, that we've had this evening centered on uh, uh, the incident in Olu, in Imo State, and vis-a-vis -vis the crisis in the Southwest. Now, uh, Dr. Sema Madi here, uh, my final question to you will be, now, what will be your advice to the Imo state government and the federal government of Nigeria regarding what we have seen happen in Olu? Okay, as a, as a political activist and also as a, 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 a protective politician, I would tell the governor, you see, um, the government, the, govern, gov, gov, the governors in South East should learn to engage the so-called militants, whoever they are. 
you can't govern a state effectively if you don't, you can't engage a very strong movement, a growing movement like what you see on ground in the southeast. You just have to find a back channel of dealing with them because it can create the enable environment for any form of development if you can't find a back channel to deal with them, talk to the leaders, and be able to de-escalate. So I think that's what's missing in the South. The, the, the demonization of these groups, whatever they are, and the not engagement creates a crisis for governance. You just have to find a way to, I, I know that the policy, the, the objectives might be, might be contradictory to each other. They may have different views, but there must be a way you can skillfully, diplomatically, that's what you're going to lead. You cannot have a significant number, a significant, a significant youth, you know, totally turn against government, totally not concerned about what they're doing, but have no confidence what they're doing. So that lack of loss of confidence is the major driver of, of, of security. If a government is discredited, as most of them are discredited, and they're not making any effort to win back their credits, to, 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 to have, unlike the Southwest, you see, most of the governments in the Southwest are also largely sellouts, like those in the Southwest maybe. But the difference is that they have a pedigree, they have a back channel, they have, capacity to engage some of these so-called militants. So they can have meetings, they can de-escalate easily, they can find a common ground, but all, all people have no common ground. So you need a shootout, you know, because you can't deal with anybody, you shoot out, that's wrong. So I would say that the, for the state government, they should learn how to govern the state appropriately. They should be able to have early warning signals of crisis, and they should deal with local intelligence and stop playing Abuja politics. Get down to deal with their people, understand them, build, build quality network and social capital with the people they are governing so they can trust their judgment when they face existential crisis. The people don't have confidence in the state governments because they are so far removed from the things that touch the people. And over the federal government, I have argued severally that Nigeria State is a weak state. So they resort to violence, to, to monopoly of violence, may not work. We should have what I call an argumentative state, a state that argues, a state that, that talks, a state that wins heart and soul, a state that is the business of you know, challenging its critics and trying to win people. It is not a state that either they bribe you or they shut you down. Uh, Nigeria is becoming largely ungoverned. And so the pretense that because we're a sovereign state, we have a monopoly of violence, monopoly of power, we can shut anybody down. We don't need to engage in good faith we don't need to listen to people's concern. We don't need to try our best to settle matter equitably. We don't need to do justice to every person and therefore create legitimacy. It's not true. It's, it's old political science. The new political science is that the state, a government, a state will jostle for legitimacy with no state actors. And so the state must be both powerful, must be effective in producing social goods and must be persuasive argumentative so, so that the state can win the heart of most of its citizens and therefore citizens themselves will be the one that protects the state. Today in Nigeria, the state is largely illegitimate, don't have credibility, ineffective and not engaged with the people. And that is not the recipe for an effective and secure state. Thank you very much. That's a fine place to leave it. And uh, before I do, I would uh, want to ask Marcel uh, to quickly uh, unmute and please make your contribution or ask your question. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much, um, Dr. Sam Amadi and uh, Mazizoki okay, for this show. Um, Dr. Sam, my question is for you because I need to understand what is the difference between a national army and a private militia? And are there like distinguishing features and if there are distinguishing features, how would you classify the activities of the Nigerian army under Buhari within the time he has been in office? Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, very, very, very tough question. Well, the difference between a private militia and the, the national army is national. <laughs> national means this an army, first, constitution, how the army is constituted. It's an army that represents a nationality. Um, in many countries in the world, we are uh, we're not as the ethnic dividing and religious lines are not very clear. Nobody will probably look at the composition of the army in terms of rank and fire. We were just celebrating the first uh, head of the Pentagon, uh, black uh, 
the Secretary of Defense in the U.S. So uh, if the army is fair, if the, you see, conflicts around identity, who is who, also becomes, you know, exaggerated when the quality is poor, when there's unfairness, injustice, ethnic cleansing. We had the Danjuma we spoke the other day about, about the Nigerian military as now an ethnic military. So because, probably because of the behavior of the leadership. So national military first represents a nation. Its, its mandate is to protect a nation, not to protect a particular people, but the national whole. So it's both in the constitution, composition, mandate, and function. So all national armies are in name, national army, all armies of a country. But in reality, we've seen in Africa, instances where the military has been ethnically captured. We saw during the time of um, uh, Idi Amin, we saw that, we've seen it across Africa, where the military is not represents an ethnic group. In fact, sometimes the military become a personalized military, defending the survival of the regime in power and not at the detriment of the nation. So in Nigerian case, of course, we have the national Nigerian army, which is in which is, which is a national military. But the question is in operation, in function, in appointment, in management, are they acting in line with that mandate of protecting all Nigerians? Now with that sort of report unverified about soldiers leading some herdsmen into Odo or so. I had the community there and they were slapping some of the Obas who supposedly resisted those. That's no longer a national military. And so that's what happened with institutions. Institutions, they're not properly monitored and vigilant. They can become, they can become captured, elite capture. So if you look at the theory of the state, political theory of state, the state is autonomous. What that means that the state is autonomous of all the contending social economic interests. But most weak states like Nigeria are captured states. They are captured either by political uh, economy, whether it's Dangote, whether it's a set of billionaires who capture the state and make the state work for all interests. They are captured by ethnic groups. In, in Nigerian history, now from 1959 at the, at the London Conference, has been a history of ethnic competition for power. That's part of my work, talking about incoherence, constitutional incoherence, that we've never had, we've created a nation where the focus is on ethnic identity. And so the force has been about ethnic competition at competing each ethnic group. So we've seen instances where the military becomes an ethnic military or a military against an ethnic group. And that's why we want to talk about ethnic cleansing. In Benue, when that happened, the governor, everybody, they lost confidence in the Nigerian security, including the Nigerian police. There are reports we get about people say, well, we arrest these guys and take the DPO, they are released because those big DPOs either they have a certain destruction or they are they are acting not professionally but based on their ethnic identities. So they they they, they, they slip from national army to ethnic army or to private militia can be very it's a it's a, a slippery slope and it can be a timeline. By the time you know it, a national army has become a privatized or ethnicized military. So in terms of definition, I would say. The difference between a national army and a private militia is that the private militia is composed, constituted to serve a private interest. Its mandate is private and its function is private. A national army is composed nationally to serve, and its mandate is national, protect the, the, the nation. Its function, the way it operates, is in line with that sovereign neutrality. It's, it's not captured by any particular interest. It's not captured by any interest. It's focused on protecting the territorial integrity and the security of the nation. And when it protects public officers, it's protecting them as a proxy of protecting the nation, not protecting them as an instrument for them to use to, to, to fight or destroy the nation as the case might be. Okay. That has happened. So in my view, um, is this a Nigerian army? Um, the national army. Yeah, in, in nomenclature, in definition, but, but operationally, gradually, you know, getting to be discredited because of some of this um, lack of neutrality. Thank you very um, much. So, um, thank you. Um, sorry, sorry, Mike, just a flop question. Thank you so much, Mr. Um, the reason why I ask this question is that 
when you follow the trend of the operations of the Nigerian military, right from when the current administration comes in, all the way from the middle belt down to any of the zones, to Lagos, to Abuja, I, I begin to question the interest in which the military is serving. Again, I do not understand the operational command of the military as in who has the power to deploy the military and then under whose authority can the military be, be deployed? Because these are the things we, the public needs to understand so that we know exactly who to hold accountable when the military commits atrocities. In the case of Olu, for instance, who exactly has the ultimate power to deploy the military? Because that's the person that the public, that the international community will hold accountable for any debt or for any action that the military commits on, on, on the ground. I agree with you. I mean, I don't even know how to do it, but essentially, the military cannot come out except they are deployed by whoever has authority to do so. I agree. Yeah, but we saw we saw that in Lekki, where right. there is this uh, confusion as to who gave order, and even the person that uh, invited them at some point denied that he hasn't got such power to even command the military. That shows that the level of transparency and professionalism in our institution, not of the military. You see, that was just uh, I was saw it all over the world that look, institutions are delicate. The way they can begin to become murderous, dangerous, if you don't monitor it. So you can have a, a military that ought to be professional, but that military might now become roguish, just like the police. So, so it's all about the descent, the, the desecration of that professional ethos. Ordinarily, they should be clear who directs the military. So if there's someone who gives instruction and the instruction is illegal, the person will be held accountable. But in Nigeria, there's I did, I did not. Who did, who did not, and the matter will go. So, so it's difficult to bank on the credibility and the credibility of Nigerian institutions at this time. Okay, thank you very much. And the final question from, uh, can you go ahead? Hello? Is that me? Yes. Right, uh, I've been listening to, uh, by the way, it's Mr. Moto, by the way, that's my name. Mazimoto. Can you hear me? Go ahead, oh. we can hear you. C can you guys hear me? I say go ahead, we can hear you. Thank you so much. You see, what all of you are saying there, it's what ought to be, not what is in Nigeria. You know, it shocks me when people talk about who is, uh, whose authority is this and that authority is that. It does show that a lot of people don't even know what is happening. All you are saying is correct in a normal situation. But you assume from what I've been hearing that Nigeria is normal. I'm telling you that the governor has no authority even to direct the commander, a colonel. You saw what happened in Lakey. Somebody mentioned it. I mean, refused to come. The army is typically and practically, and I can prove it without any, any hesitation, the army is a jihadist, not an army, period. So when you guys talk about who is authority, who ought to do this and so on, you miss the point. The point is Nigeria is not a normal situation. Thank you, Here man. you have a colonel who is not, who will not even pick up a phone from a governor. So let us be real, let us not deceive ourselves. Nigeria is not a normal situation. If anybody thinks I'm ready to put any amount of money that Hopu Zadema, the commander in Obinze, will not even listen to him. Just like the commander in Lagos refused to do what? To attend inquiry, not even just to attend. You know, it's occupation army we have in Nigeria. You guys are talking about what's, what is normal. We don't talk about what is normal in Nigeria. It's not normal. The army is basically not an occupation jihadist army, period. Hey, thank you very that. much. I think you're basically repeating the same thing. Thank you that, on that note. Thank no, you. That's, that's all I'm saying. Okay. So let thank us you. not deceive ourselves with all these, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, I call it talk show and whatever. Let's go back to basic. Everybody should port, face the train, go, go on board the train of reconstruction, I mean, a restructuring. Nothing other than restructuring will work. Nothing other than that. Thank There's you very no much. basis. Thank but you very much on that note. Uh, so 
Um, Dr. Samamade, what's your parting shot on this now? Thank you. Well, uh, my parting shot is that there are two schools of thoughts. One says, things fall apart. The center cannot hold. The other one says, things fall apart. Let's make the center hold. That is a contending perspective in Nigeria. I don't disagree with the sentiment expressed by him that the way the issues are working now, they don't give confidence. But the question is, is there a way we can make them work? So uh, my own view is that uh, the, 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 the level of suffering and hardship and violence that people are going through can be mitigated. Can, we, we can have, even if Nigeria will uh, decide to go the separate path, or Nigeria may even, in fact, look, after this is what is that Nigeria may actually break down completely based on incompetence and corruption. So it just collapse as a state because uh, the prospect is very bleak. Second, is that Nigeria can also solve their problem and create a society based on what I call democratic citizenship, which is what it serves the evils best. That look, let all of us have freedom, liberty, merit, do our businesses, no harassment, everything, everywhere you live, you live peacefully. We live in America, we live in London, we live in Europe. So our, our aspiration is universalist, universalistic. We want a society that treats everybody as one, treats everybody equal, allows merit, punish wrong as wrong, not a society that's based on prerogatives, based on privilege, whether it's ethnic or religious. So that if somebody has a right religious pedigree, he escapes punishment. If somebody doesn't have it, he is condemned. We want a Nigeria that can work. Now, even if it's not possible, we I am in support of some peaceful change. I'm not in support of what we are what we're fighting now is a war of attrition. The state using its force to support citizens' violence. It's totally wrong for citizens to be killed. You go to Olo and they say you see that kind of shooting by the Nigerian military. It degrades the military. The military should not be found fighting with citizen groups. If there are some uh, citizen groups that have acted illegally or criminally, they should be proceeded against according to the constitution. There's no basis in the state where the state's own military will be the one killing the citizen, not in a state of war. So my pattern short is that every governor, and if I'm a governor, I, I agree with you, look, it's not true that the governors have no power. Governors have enough capacity to change the game. They're not too teleguided. It's because of their own greed. They are first, they don't have the pedigree. These are governors who are never part of civic struggle. These are governors who are never part of any organized social movement. These are governors who probably were wheelers and dealers in Abuja and they become governor. So where do they learn the art of community building and community consultation? So it's not necessarily that they have no capacity. Abuja constrains them is that they love to be constrained because they, they, they're they looking at the next election and not looking at building their political capital around their people. If the governors serve their people well, the people will reverse the authority. And then even, see, it's possible for a governor, we should see the Southeast to become a nation in a nation. The constitution allows so much that the governors are not using. The governors can't do better than they're doing and they should do better than they're doing. Exactly. That's a fine place to leave it. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sam Ahmadi. And um, as you rightly said, there is no justification whatsoever for the military incursion in a civilian space. On that note, we say for those who have ears, let them hear. We, um, you know, we do believe that uh, the uh, escalation or rather that what we would have next is de-escalation that um, like you mentioned, when crimes are committed, the state should use the civil authority to deal and investigate and punish if found wanting those who were involved and not to use the national army, as you rightly pointed out, in order to get into civilian space. And, you know, when I saw some of the videos where I think on a third road, where it's soldiers basically lay down, take their position, as if they are in, you know, in a war front, and you you keep asking yourself, how did we come to this point? Again, as one of the uh, commentators said, Nigeria is not a normal nation where things work. On that note, I will say thank you very much once more uh, for joining us this evening. I remain Mazezo this is Media TV. Thank you. <laughs>